I read books, I breathe, I eat, I sleep. I have worries. I'm a very normal person. I just have a slightly different job. I've got a family to support and I couldn't do it alone with all the debts I had. I'd like to have a very nice home. I'd like to have it very well furnished, a nice car and just some little luxuries. Three intelligent young women that any mother would be proud to say, she is my daughter. And very probably those mothers are watching this program. It is unlikely though that their mothers are proud of them because they are prostitutes. Midwinter in Auckland Harbour. A birthday party is underway on board the Rainbow Warrior. The two powerful explosive charges being laid are expertly placed. It was pure journalistic instinct, really. I suppose I had the feeling that the French gung-ho attitude on nuclear tests would mean that they would take extreme measures against Greenpeace. It was such an unexpected crime, such an unlikely act of terrorism, it's still difficult to believe it really happened. They passed through the normal customs checks without difficulty. After about two days, we actually started to realise the, the Rainbow Warrior story had legs. I mean, there were things to discover. There was something su supremely suspicious. Although the so-called Swiss couple made an effort to be anonymous, in New Zealand, this isn't easy. The public delivered to the police a detailed account of their movements, right down to what they had for breakfast. It was like a detective story that was unfolding in front of us, and, and we were going from location to location, filming bits and pieces of the story to, to eventually make it up. So we didn't know from the very beginning how it was going to end. I've been very lucky. I've had a, a close group of friends who, none of whom have rejected me or made me feel like a leper or, or anything. John here, are you lovers? Yes. Yes. How long have you been together? Four years. How has it affected your relationship? I think we've become a little bit closer. We've had only four years to build our friendship up, so... Hasn't done anything same. for a sex life, though. <laughs> the coroner heard evidence of police methods in the West. One dragged an Aboriginal to the van by the hair. A sergeant drinking off duty watched and approved. He told the inquest that Aboriginals, when stirred up and looking for a fight, tend to get very greasy and slippery. We'd begun to notice at Four Corners that there were an awful lot of Aboriginal deaths happening in Western Australia, either in prisons or in police custody. At the core of the story of black deaths at that time was the shocking death of a young man called John Pat. <laughs> Here, for me for the first time, that sound of Aboriginal mourning was one of the reasons that I felt a need to keep going ever since, looking at these issues. The sound of grief and anger, which is at the same time absolutely native to this country and so foreign to white experience. Are your members racist thugs? No. Could people from the outside be forgiven for thinking they are when they read these reports from Western Australia? Well, I can't really assess what pe how people outside West Australia may view the situation. That show was certainly one of the reasons that there was eventually a royal commission into those black deaths. And we're all very proud of that. <laughs> It's a billion dollar industry, and the seemingly endless chances for making money, for losing money, and for washing dirty money make the track on race day a mecca. Horses for courses. It was about, it was about the seamy side of Sydney. It was about illegal casinos. It was about gambling. It was about laying off bets, fixing dogs, fixing horse races, about 
people following one another and delivering messages and packets. Shortly after 10pm, only two minutes before the start of the Journalist Cup, Kilcoyne was scratched from the race. The level of research in that program was almost unbelievable. I mean, we had three people working on it full time for a long period of time, myself, Sean Hoyt, the producer, who is a marvellous journalist, as well as being a great film producer. And then we had a new researcher into, into Four Corners, um, Deb Whitmont, who was a trained lawyer. And the three of us spent, I would say, months nailing down this information piece by piece. But for unwary gamblers with fat wallets, the place was a trap. We've been told that at least one of the blackjack games at the casino was rigged. It was gutsy. It was very bold journalism, and that, and that was Tony. He, he didn't pull his punches, and it was courageous, and it went a long way, and I suppose, as we discovered, that had its consequences. Bill Waterhouse and son Robbie have brought criminal defamation charges against reporter Tony Jones and the executive producer of Four Corners, Peter Manning. The result was endless writs, um, uh, endless accusations, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, fighting in the courts. It was on one of those occasions, I can't recall exactly which one, but on one of those days we'd spent in court, we came outside and there were actually journalists waiting to speak to us and they said, uh, well, we're here to tell you you've actually won the Walkley Award for this particular story. And uh, at the time I was almost speechless, um, partly because, you know, there were extraordinary other um, and maybe even more deserving stories like the Moonlight State, Chris Masters story, around at the time. In the last month, I've spoken to a young policewoman who says that on the walls of the station they write NRMA, nothing really matters anymore. I've spoken to a detective constable who insists that 99% of police are totally honest and near to tears tries to explain to me that the problem is they simply can't rock the boat. I've spoken to a detective sergeant who says that to survive in this place you have to discover neutral territory where you see no evil and hear no evil, particularly if it's evil within. And I guess the final word should go to a retired senior policeman who says, what's the point? I spent my whole career bashing my head against a brick wall. It made no difference. The public really don't care anyway. And in the end, the crooks win. It was a very difficult and lonely time. Um, it was, it was dem demoralising. People used to say, today's news is tomorrow's wrappings. You know, you'll do more harm than good. Break his camera, break his mouth, too. Break his camera and break his mouth too was the order. One of the three bouncers obliged, fortunately for our crew, only with the former request. You're not dealing with a with a cheerful subject. We worked very hard. We worked for three months without a day off. The end result, of course, was the Fitzgerald inquiry and the great skills of uh, Fitzgerald at getting uh, people to give evidence uh, ensured that the truth came out. After the Moonlight State, there were well over a, a hundred convictions. The pressures since the Moonlight State have been enormous and, and most particularly on Chris Masters. I still don't feel good about it because if I thought that it was painful to do then, I didn't really know anything about what I was in for. I was in for this sort of defamation decade and the death by a thousand courts. I mean, I think it probably took about three years of intense labour over a 13-year period um, to defend the story. I mean, ultimately, the justification of what we did was proven, but, but I don't think that that was much of a victory for journalism. This is all dust. Oh, yeah. It's all dust. As you can see, that's been here for 22 years, and yet it's still here. This is the kind of dust that was flying around, and people had to wear it in their skin, in their face, in their nose, in their ears, everywhere. I'll show you Blue that. Death was about an asbestos mine in Western Australia at Whittenham, where they had mined blue asbestos until the 1960s, from memory. It was an absolutely appalling shocking story. It was one, I think, that I'm 
probably most proud of of all the things I've done. Well, I just think that was, you know, it is a story that I, I impacted on everyone. I mean, it, that, I don't think that's left any of us. I mean, all the people in that story, all the talent, were dead within 18 months. Some, I think, were dead before the show even got to air. This is my mother and my stepfather. That's Esther and Phil McKenna. My mother died of mesothelioma in 1975, September 1975. And my stepfather, Phil McKenna, died in 1970, 10th of October 1970, with asbestosis. Her husband wasn't well either. Um, I remember sitting on the sofa with her and her just sort of dissolving into tears, basically. Um, Oh, it's a very sad, sad memory. I'm sorry. But nobody deserves to die the way that they... That they died. It's cruel. But nobody wants to know. Just nobody. On a sunny Saturday, Perth's Kings Park is the perfect place for a picnic. One can only wish that there were more days just like it. Because for Barbara Tyler, there may not be. I felt, I think, most affected by the woman at the end of the story, who was only 34 and convinced that she was going to fight off mesothelioma. There's nothing much doctors can do, but I will try. I will get through it. How? What are you going to do? Um, I'll get through it. Um, I'm positive meditation, alternative medicine. I think in that interview, it really showed Paul at his best, that that one succinct, sort of almost innocent line that just said it all when the children were there and they were playing off in the trees or something. And in the interview, Paul said, have you told the kids? And how do you tell the kids? What about the kids? Have you told them? Not everything at the moment. What do they know or what do they think? They know I'm sick and I have to watch my diet and... I think she died before the program went to air. I think what Four Corners did was to... to provide a climate in which it made it very difficult for CSR to keep on fighting. CSR denied absolutely that they had liability. They denied all sorts of undeniable things about what they knew. I think they behaved shockingly. Um, but after the program went to air, they eventually decided to give way at least on some of the, some of the cases. The Queen Elizabeth military barracks outside Suva was heavily guarded by soldiers, hiding their identity with gas masks and balaclavas. Do you want to stop here? What are you doing? Stay there. Stop, stop, stop. Stop there. OK. OK. Thank you. No, we've been down at the Parliament. You were there in the morning? Yes. Hi. It's uh, Marion Wilkinson from Australian Television. No comment. Is there anyone? Yeah, we'll clear the road. Is there anyone who can talk to us at all? Any? How would you a press conference later on? A press conference here? Uh, they will be notified where and when. Uh-huh, right. But there's no one who can talk to us. Can you tell us whether Dr. Bavandra's OK? And he's staying here, is he? Yes. And the other members of the government? Being OK meant the nation's prime minister and government were herded at gunpoint like convicts, hostages of the military. Liberal frontbencher John Moore, one of the key backroom boys who pulled off last week's dramatic leadership coup in Canberra. And that security had to be the hallmark. You didn't go outside into risky areas. For three months, Moore and four trusted Liberal colleagues 
single-mindedly plotted to deliver the Liberal Party leadership to Andrew Peacock for a second time. They affected one of the most professional political operations seen in the party for some years. And they took almost every political commentator by surprise. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, obviously by your attendance here, uh, you're aware that there have been some changes uh, in the upper echelons of the parties on our side of politics. True Believers was an attempt to capture on film a political coup and it was the then demise of John Howard, short-lived as it turned out, and the rise of Andrew Peacock. I was sent down to Canberra uh, by Peter Manning to see what I could find out and I bumped into Wilson Tucky. And I said to him at one point, but how did you do it so secretively? And he said, oh, it was easy, just lied to everybody. We tended to do our best to keep people isolated uh, themselves. But secondly, uh, at times, I guess, by downright lying. And before I knew it, Tucky was on the phone saying, yes, I'll do it. And that contact had to take account that as soon as we went and told Howard, that of course people would be being contacted by him and we were asking them to make sure they didn't answer their phone, that they didn't talk to reporters. And the simplest way to do that was just don't answer the phone. My memory is that is that it took me until I actually saw it in the editing room to believe that the politicians had actually gone on record to, you know, show their dirty deeds in public. It was just madness. might be one of the longest uncut single shots maybe ever run <laughs> in a Four Corners program. We always thought this was somehow the most perfect image of how fragile and how beautiful Antarctica is itself. With its long-standing claim to 42% of the Antarctic continent, Australia is a key player in deciding the future of this extraordinary place. The federal government has up till now held out against signing the 1988 Minerals Convention, which could, for the first time, open the Antarctic to commercial mining and oil exploration. Environmentalists are pressuring the government to lead the world and make an outright refusal. But soon after the program, I think within a few days, John Howard came out and said Antarctica should not be exploited. Oh, I thought it was an excellent story and did have an impact on me. I was opposition leader at the time and not long after that program I uh, declared opposition to uh, the mining in the Antarctic on behalf of the then opposition and the government followed pretty soon thereafter. It was here in the Cook Islands that Bond Corporation last year made 90% of its profit, $250 million. And you may think that's rather remarkable because one of the things you notice about this place is there are no TUI's ads on the television. There's no Bond airships flying around over your head. And you can't even buy Bond beer. In fact, there's no... I think it's vital to take on the big end of town. Um, not many people do that. And that's where the power is. And that's where the nastiest and worst deals get done. Four Corners has raised questions about the way he and his directors made money at their shareholders' expense about the low tax rate Bond Group pays compared to other Australian public companies and about the status of some of the profits Bond Group tells the world it has made. I think the original Four Corners helped push Bond Corporation into liquidation or, you know, to, to make it go broke, basically. It would probably have gone that way anyway, but um, in fact it would have gone that way anyway. I think it hurried it on, though. It made public confidence in Bond Corporation and Alan Bond collapse essentially.